Good morning, First Presbyterian Church. It's an honor to be here on the Lord's Day with you all. We hope that you uh, have come expecting, just as we have, for a mighty work of the Lord. For we know that as we preach the Word and read the Word and sing the Word and pray the Word, that our Lord would give us success, for His Word tells us so. His Word tells us that uh, as His gospel goes out, it never returns to us empty. It's always encouraging believers, convicting sinners, and saving to the uttermost. Uh, and so we, we expect our Lord to do those very things uh, this morning. Uh, we are here to do uh, those very things this morning. And so as we commit ourselves to a worship that's regulated by the Word of God, we know that our Lord will work amongst us. Now we can surely say as we leave this place that, that we have been in the presence of the Almighty and He has uh, changed us and conformed us more into the image of His Son uh, for His glory. Before we enter into worship, there's a number of announcements on the back of your bulletin on page 8. Um, I have some updates to these announcements, some new announcements, and so um, I hope that you'll uh, pay attention to these announcements with us. Uh, our midweek fellowship meals and children's classes did end this past Wednesday on May 25th, which means uh, that we will not have fellowship meals and we will not have children's classes uh, this upcoming Wednesday, but we will still have adult prayer meeting at 6.30. Uh, and so the only event that's taking place on, uh, on uh, the midweek Wednesday is prayer meeting at 6.30. Uh, and you are all uh, more than welcome to uh, join us. This is also the first week that we are uh, breaking for the summer with Children's Church. Um, and so the order of service does say that Children's Church will be dismissed right before or during the pastoral prayer. Please um, ignore that statement. It was just an oversight by the office. Uh, we will not have Children's Church. If you uh, have a young one that just refuses to be quiet, please know that it doesn't bother me. And if it doesn't bother me, it shouldn't bother anybody else here. So let them be, you know, um, let them be loud and glad uh, and you know, praise the Lord um, for some children. Uh, but if you just can't bear it, uh, the Fellowship Hall, is sh the service is streaming down there, uh, and they can cut front flips and cartwheels uh, down in the Fellowship Hall, and you can listen to the service uh, as needed. And so we're going to use that as our quote-unquote cry room for uh, the, the summer. Um, also, if you uh, were paying attention uh, to your order of worship, the office, there was a slight oversight with uh, communion. Uh, Pastor Don did a fine job serving communion to you last week, and so we're not going to do it again. Um, and so we're, we're, we're going to skip that part of our liturgy this morning. Uh, our next communion service will be June the 26th during our evening worship service, just for your information. Uh, the office will be closed tomorrow in observance for Memorial Day. And of course... Um, we don't celebrate Memorial Day, we observe Memorial Day because this is a, uh, a remembering of those who uh, lost their lives fighting for the freedom uh, of our nations. And so uh, we would encourage you to remember that on this day, that, that men and women lost their lives to fight for this nation who practices and upholds religious freedom so that we might worship in peace this morning. Uh, but also tomorrow, uh, it's a day off, quote unquote, but nonetheless it is a a day of, of observance and remembrance uh, for those who gave their all uh, for our freedom. Uh, there is a, a short Memorial Day service tomorrow at the city complex, which starts at what time, Mr. Harlow? 11 a.m., and so we would encourage you to go uh, if you are free. I think the last announcement that I have that I have written down on my sheet here is that our new choir director, Rebecca Coleman, uh, we'll start practicing with the choir this upcoming Tuesday night, Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Her first official Sunday with us will be June the 19th, Father's Day. Uh, but she'll start practicing with the choir this upcoming Tuesday night. So if you are in the choir, interested in joining the choir, or used to be in the choir, and you're looking for a reason to get back in, this is your reason. Um, please come back and join us. Uh, at 6 p.m. this uh, upcoming Tuesday evening for practice with our new choir director, uh, Rebecca Coleman. The Christian Education Committee will meet June the 5th in the Fellowship Hall with Ruling Elder Kay McGirt to finalize plans for the summer and vacation Bible school, which we are looking forward to in July, July 
the 10th through the 14th, I believe, are the dates for Bible school. So if you're interested in helping, please make plans to attend that committee meeting as well. But as David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let our hearts be glad and let us prepare for worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from the 35th Psalm. Each and every Sunday we respond to this call to worship together, me reading the regular print and then us reading together the bold. If you'll please stand up as we are called to worship by our God. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in His salvation. O Lord, who is like You? There is none like You. Let those who delight in the righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say forevermore, Great is the Lord. Then we will tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. So we commit this day to the Lord, for it is His day. And as we proclaim His righteousness and sing His praises, let us turn to hymn number 164 and let us sing together, O four, a thousand tongues to sing. Let's pray. Our Lord, we do come to you this morning, Lord. We come uh, by the power of your Spirit and by the enabling of your Spirit. And our God in heaven, we come to you through 
uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, your eternal Son, our Lord, uh, the one mediator between God and man, the one whom, through whom we must come, Lord, to come to you. Uh, but Lord, we do come as children wishing to and desiring to worship and praise your name, Lord, desiring to be, to be blessed by you, to have your presence, Lord, uh, with us this morning. Our Father, you are worthy of our worship. Uh, though we come to you with stammering uh, lips and tongues and words, Lord, you are the one who does not change. You are the glorious one, and it is to you alone that we come. Father, we thank you uh, for this morning that we're able to come even in this building together and, and in comfort worship you, uh, and we thank you for this gift, Lord. And now we do remember the way that uh, Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we come to you together praying. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Man, well, if you'd take your hymnal one more time and turn to hymn number 469, uh, please remain standing as you're able and let us sing together How Sweet and Awesome is the Place, hymn number 469. Please be seated. 
Well, as we come to this time of the giving of our tithes and offerings, uh, let us remember uh, even the words that we just read. Um, if it were not for God's grace, we would not have chosen what a gift it is uh, to have God come and, and bring us to life and open our hearts. Uh, deacons, if you'd please come forward. Our Father in heaven, we uh, do come to you, Lord, to, to give thanks, to give thanks for these tithes and offerings just given, uh, Lord, but to thank you as well as we do uh, look at and know that it will be in this country, Lord, um, Memorial Day tomorrow, Lord. We thank you uh, for the ability to worship together, uh, to freely proclaim the gospel and meet together as we are right now. Um, we pray that we'd be faithful and we'd be faithful uh, with the gifts, the time, but these monetary gifts as well, that they'd go forward for your kingdom and, Lord, be used for your will and for that alone. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as you're seated, if you have a Bible or if you'd like to use a pew Bible, I would encourage you to turn to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56, this can be found in your pew Bible on page 783. As we continue on in Isaiah, uh, we're going to see this morning that Isaiah himself foresees a day uh, where he encourages those who are, who are not God's people of the flesh, who are not Jews, the Gentiles, uh, probably all uh, or most of us indeed. And he encourages them that the fact that they were born a, apart from God, uh, to not be discouraged by that. That is, that is not the ultimate uh, dividing line between people on the earth, uh, but rather those who turn to God in faith, those who turn uh, to Christ in faith, have as good of an inheritance, as close a relationship with God as anybody of any ethnicity or any background like that. Again, we will see that this morning uh, in chapter 56 of Isaiah, 
And of course, we saw that this in the New Testament as Christ comes and the Apostle Paul and as the church goes out preaching to the Gentile, I'm sorry, to the Jews and to the Gentiles uh, that we're one in Christ. So again, Isaiah chapter 56, please give your attention now to God's word. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him beside those already gathered. All you beasts of the field come to devour, all you beasts in the forests. His watchmen are blind, they are all without knowledge, they are all silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite, they never have enough. But they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. As far as the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Don. As we uh, now turn our attention back to our God in prayer, let me remind you that we are not dismissing for uh, Children's Church this morning. Not dismissing for Children's Church this morning. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for uh, the opportunity again to come to you in prayer, knowing that you are our Heavenly Father, who the Apostle Paul declares in 2 Corinthians 1, that you are full of mercies. That you have mercies uh, that abound for us in each and every circumstance of life. And even as we, uh, even as we bow our heads to come to you uh, in prayer, as your children, you bend an ear from the throne of heaven to listen with the promise that, that as we ask for things in your name, as we ask according to your will, that we may have it, uh, that we may enjoy it so that you might uh, be glorified and that you might work for our good. And so, Father, we know that we have not, for we ask not. And so, Father, we ask first and foremost, as Jesus taught us in Luke, that we should ask for more of the Spirit. And so, Father, that is what we ask for primarily. We ask for more of the Spirit so that we might grow spiritually, so that we might have a closer walk with Thee, so that we might be drawn unto Yourself, be conformed more into the image of Thy Son, And that is exactly what we need, O Lord, for we are sinners who struggle with our flesh. We are sinners who need to be more holy. We need to be more righteous. And of course, your Son is full of holiness, full of righteousness. And you promise us that by your Word and by your Spirit, you are molding and making us into His image so that we might be found aright, so that we might be pure, so that we might be Uh, worthy to hear those words at the end of the day. Welcome in, my good and faithful servant, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Father, as co-heirs of Jesus, we know that by our justification, you see us as holy and righteous in your sight. For we are clothed in the very righteousness of Jesus, our Savior and our Redeemer. And yet, O Lord, we struggle with our flesh on this side of glory. We, like the Apostle Paul, declare 
that we do the very thing that we hate, that we know what we ought to do and yet we don't do them, that we are slow to obey, that we are quick to break the commandments. And, O oh Lord, you tell us that as we come confessing that you are first long-suffering with your people, that you are patient and you are merciful, but also that you are forgiving, that you take our sins and you cast them into the depths of the ocean and you remember them no more. And so let us be a people of confession. Let us be a people that are, that's totally reliant upon the Word and the Spirit to sanctify us. And let us be a people who long for the day that we see Christ. For when we see Christ, we will be like Him. Holy and blameless and righteous. So Father, we pray that You would not tarry. For we know that our sin will be no more uh, when You usher us into glory. And we know that death will be no more and we know that 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 sickness will be no more we are we are people who uh, suffer in this life we we struggle with the loss of loved ones we mourn the loss of loved ones we uh, struggle with sickness we grow in our weariness when we are ill and so father we pray that you would grant uh, our doctors much wisdom we thank you for the common grace of, of doctors and medicines. We, we thank you for the common grace of, of, of men and women who are trained to, to help us navigate medical issues. And, and we thank you that you give us those people that are accessible to us so that we might uh, be on the road to recovery. And, and yet, O oh Lord, we also pray that if it be your will that you would heal us even immediately from these ailments and these pains and these sufferings that we deal with each and every day. We know many upon many within this church, within our families, within our friends groups that deal with, with daily struggles, daily circumstances that, that keep us down. And so, Father, we pray for medical answers for those, who are, for those who are seeking them. We pray for healing for those who need healing. We pray, O oh Lord, for... Uh, good doctors, wise doctors to surround us and help us in this journey, if that be your will. Father, we do pray for our greatest need, our, our need to, to be enlightened, uh, our need for the Word of God to be illuminated before us. And so, Father, as we turn our attention to your Word here in just a few moments, we pray that it would be unto us as David in Psalm 119, a GPS for daily living. We pray that it would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path so that we may walk aright. So that people might know that we belong to Thee both by our words and by our actions. As, as Kay prays so often, we pray that we would carry a banner of Christ so large that the world may never misunderstand to whom we belong. And we belong to You. And so let us live a life that exemplifies that fact. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be a people who are thankful. Thankful for the gifts that you have given us from above. Thankful for those things that we often overlook. The psalmist David thanks you that you woke him up in the morning. And we pray that we would hit, hit the ground running each and every morning and be thankful. We, thankful, we, are, uh, we pray that we would be thankful for uh, our families and for our friends. We pray that we would be thankful for our our jobs and our occupations. We pray that we would be thankful for even things like the civil government here both locally, statewide, and national. And that we would uh, pray for them as your word exhorts us to. We pray, O oh Lord, that especially this weekend that we would be thankful for those men and women who have laid down their lives for our freedoms. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give comfort to their families even now. That we would never forget as we gather here on the Lord's Day that it's, that it's, that it's by the blood that was shed by our military that, that we have religious freedom. And Father, we pray that we would also remember as we gather here on the Lord's Day that it's by the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ Himself that we are a redeemed people gathered in His name. And so Father, would You show us Christ this morning through Your Word? Would You teach us how to love You more? And in turn... Uh, serve you more for the advancement of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Speak to us now. Your servants are listening. Give us those ears to hear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you will turn your attention to uh, Mark chapter 12. We're continuing in our journey through the gospel of Mark. 
If you've been with us, we have been journeying through this gospel for quite some time now. It's our plan to uh, finish up the gospel of Mark by the end of this year. Uh, of course, we'll be taking a break for uh, the summer. We, we preach through the Psalms during uh, the summer months, and we'll be starting that very soon. But we're on Sermon 45 of this series through the Gospel of Mark, and we come to uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. If you're using a pew Bible, that's on page 1079, or begins there, 1079. And we come to a passage this morning that actually we will probably uh, know well. If you don't know this passage well, per se, you will know the command of Jesus, I think, fairly well when he commands... Uh, the scribe here to love God and love neighbor, what he will call the great commandment. But it ties very intimately into the text that Pastor Don preached for us uh, last week, uh, talking about the resurrection. You know, it's, it's the very fact of the resurrection that we come here on Sunday mornings because we believe that our God is living each and every Sunday. Uh, You might say that we proclaim that that we celebrate Easter each and every Sunday because it's a resurrection day. Our our Lord is living, and that matters for us in in practical living on this side of glory. And that's exactly what I think we need to see here in our text. See how the resurrection ties into our practical living. How Jesus' resurrection, in fact moves into our regeneration, our new birth, and then moves into a sacrificial love for God and for neighbor. I think that's the logical flow of this text that we have before us. And so let's read it. Verses 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing. Remember, this is Jesus and some of the religious leaders He heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, he answered wisely, He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. You know, so often when we read our Bibles, there seems to be some some potholes or maybe some uh, dangers that we face when trying to apply the Bible unto ourselves. And I think that sometimes it's very dangerous and actually very tempting for us to take a text like this or or a commandment like this from Jesus and say something along the lines of, yep, that's what I'm going to do. When, When Jesus says something like, love God, love neighbor, our immediate response is, yep, I'm going to do that as if it's some sort of New Year's resolution. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, it's May, late May, um, the very end of May, and and a lot of our New Year's resolutions aren't even on our radar anymore. In in fact, you might be to the point in your New Year's resolutions that you don't even remember what your New Year's resolutions were. Um, And and admittedly, for some of my quote-unquote New Year's resolutions, that seems to be the case. I even thought that I folded up my New Year's resolutions and put them in my wallet so that I could remember them, but obviously I don't even remember where I put my New Year's resolutions. And and yet, when we come to commandments like these, love God, love neighbor, we kind of add it to the list, don't we? And say, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. 
alongside of losing weight, organizing the garage, learning a new skill, and memorizing Leviticus. That, that's kind of the New Year's resolutions, right? And so we put on that list that we're going to love God and, and, and love neighbor. All the while, it's actually impossible to do so. In our natural self, it is it's quite impossible to love God to the standard that He is telling the scribe and to love our neighbor as, as much as we love ourselves. And you say, well, well, Pastor Matt, I'm just not buying that. You know, I do love God. Well, praise the Lord. I, I'm, I'm, I love that you love God. But do you love Him with all of your mind, soul, heart, strength? Well, well Pastor Matt, I'm a, I'm a kind person. And, and praise the Lord, our church is full of kind people until they're, you know, offended and you want to shout and scream and throw things at, at your spouse or your children and and so maybe you are pleasant to be around 95% of the time, but boy, that 5% is kind of rough. And, and so we don't do this commandment that the Lord spells out for us with perfection. We, we don't love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. We don't love God with all of our being. And, and you say, well, Pastor Matt, what are we to do with a text like this then? Well, that's the good news of the resurrection, I think. Apart from the resurrection of Christ, which ties into our new birth, as we'll see here in a moment, we're actually by nature a very unloving people. We're unloving towards God. We're unloving towards others. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are actually dead in our sins and our trespasses, hating God and hating the ways of God. Considering ourselves to be the wisest of the wise and, and the best of the best. And, and considering ourselves to be our own God. Trying to do life on our own terms. And so you say, by nature, we are actually shunning God and, and shunning each other. And that's how we're wired because of sin being ushered into the world all the way back at the Garden of Eden. But the resurrection points us to the good news of the gospel. Because it's now in the, in the resurrection that our minds flip from this idea that yes, we can do that, to yes, Jesus did that. And because Jesus did that, now we are clothed in the righteousness of our Lord and Savior Jesus, and no matter how wicked and depraved and messed up and self-absorbed of a sinner I am, I can look to Christ in my new life. And I can see, yes, the example of perfect righteousness. Yes, the example of the perfect love towards the Father and the perfect love towards one another. And yes, I can mimic those things, but also I have been given a new birth in Him. You know, it's, it's the Apostle Paul in, in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 through 8, that says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's who we are by nature. But the resurrection tells us by our new birth, by our, this is a seminary word, our regeneration in Jesus Christ, we are made anew and now we walk in the death and the resurrection that Jesus did. We, we die to our old self. And we are raised to a newness of life. Now we are no longer hostile to God. Now we are no longer ultimately failing to submit to God's law. No longer are we living in the flesh that cannot please God. But on the reverse of that, in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, Now we are in the Spirit. And because we are in the Spirit, we may live unto righteousness just as Christ is righteous i think it's i really do think that it's romans chapter 8 that that the authors of the heidelberg catechism begin to begin to pin lord's day number 17 if you know anything about the about the heidelberg catechism it's, it's broken up in questions yes questions numbers and answers but it's also broken up for us in lord's day uh lord's days and, and lord's day 17 is all about the resurrection in fact it's one of the only lord's days 
uh, that has one question because this question packs a punch, I think. What benefits does the believer receive in the resurrection? And it says that he shares in the righteousness of Christ and by the power of Christ's resurrection, we are raised to new life as well. And that's the connection. That's the connection between verses 18 through 20, 27 to 28 through 34. See, the resurrection has to come. This is how the text flows. The resurrection of Christ must come so that our new life might come, so that our obedience might come. And so it goes from resurrection to regeneration. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercies, He has called us, caused us to be born again, that's regeneration, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What is that living hope? That we might be found aright at the end of the day, so that we might be with Jesus, our Savior, from ever and ever. And so Jesus was raised from the tomb, raised from the dead on that first Easter Sunday. And just as He is living, now we have new life. As we are born again, we are regenerated by God's grace. And isn't this all the, all the conversation that's happening between Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Remember, Nicodemus is one of these same members of this religious establishment. He's a religious leader who, who by night wants to ask Jesus of some very serious spiritual things. And he begins to sit down and he begins to talk to Jesus in John chapter 3 about this idea of eternal life. Jesus, how do I receive? How do I inherit eternal life? How do I how do I receive this regeneration, this salvation? What must I do to be saved? Nicodemus is asking. And Jesus' response is very simple. You must be born again. And if you put yourselves into the shoes of Nicodemus there for just a few moments, you, you might think, just as Nicodemus is, how am I to be born again? Am I to crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again physically? And Jesus says, no, absolutely not. We are talking about a spiritual newness of life. And John chapter 3 ties so intimately into John's first letter to the church of Ephesus when he begins to give you these tests. These tests to see if you have been really born again. To see if you are are one of the ones who are truly living for Christ. And he says, the one who truly lives for Christ bears much fruit for the kingdom of God. And that's exactly where this logically flows. From the resurrection to new life to sacrificial love for God and for neighbor. This great commandment that, that the Lord Jesus spells out for this scribe that comes up to him in verse 28 is all about a newness of life if we try to do this on our own if we try to just add it to a new year's resolution list and says i'm going to love god perfectly and i'm going to love my neighbor perfectly we're going to fail but but if we're but if we're if we're striving to obey for striving to be righteous and to live righteously as Christ did, there might be times of stumbling. And there might be times that you fall flat on your face, but you will always be moving forward. And that is what Jesus is asking for here, demanding here. He's asking for a people who will strive to love God and to love neighbor. And by this love, showing that they belong to the Heavenly Father. You know, up until this point in Mark's gospel, we have seen some very, some very intense moments, I guess you can say, between Jesus and the religious leaders. You've seen some intense opposition that's been coming against Jesus. They're challenging his authority, trying to catch him in, in tricks and riddles so that he might, uh, so that he might offend the people or offend the Roman government. You might remember. They're, they're trying to put it into Jesus. And so they're always coming with a hostile heart towards Him. 
And yet, in verse 28, we see a scribe who, who doesn't come with any sort of hostility within his heart. He actually overhears the dispute happening between the Sadducees and Jesus regarding the resurrection. And so he comes up with another question. What commandment is most important of all? This is not a trick by the scribe. This is not hostile from the scribe. This is a genuine question that he needs Jesus to answer. He's not coming with any sort of antagonistic language. He's coming with a very sympathetic desire to hear Jesus speak, to hear Jesus teach. And he says in verse 32, after Jesus replies to him, you are right. You are right, teacher. Now immediately you must understand that this is very different from uh, the kind of the manipulative, I guess you can say. The flattery that has existed within the religious establishment up until this point. This scribe really does believe that Jesus has just taught him rightly. Jesus has taught him rightly, has taught him well, to the point where Jesus says, essentially, you're on the right track. You are getting closer to the kingdom of God. It's as if Jesus is telling him, the Spirit of God in my Word is drawing you unto myself so that you might be saved. But Jesus gives this remarkable statement. This remarkable statement that's that's completely unlike anything he's told the religious leaders up until this point. You are on the right track. You are on the way to the kingdom of heaven. It's not you are wrong, as he told the religious establishment in verses 24 and 27. It, it, it's not that you are a servant of Satan, as he's told the religious establishment before. It, it's not that you are far from the kingdom of God, as he tells the religious establishment even in verse Verse 34, he says that you are on the right track. There's an openness to you. There's, there's a readiness to, you, to listen and to heed what I say. My Father is drawing you, he is essentially telling them. And I think we need to pause there for just a moment. Before we even get into the command of love God and love neighbor, I think we need to pause there because always there's a response to the preaching of God's Word, isn't there? When we were preaching through the Acts narrative on Sunday evenings, uh, we, we saw these responses clearly before us, and we really could boil them down into two separate responses. Either you are open and willing to hear Christ, or you are going to shun Him away. And now, all of a sudden, don't we have that picture before us? The scribe, yes, is an unbeliever. He's a part of the religious establishment, and yet, he comes with a humility ready to hear Jesus speak, ready to hear Jesus teach, ready to even accept what Jesus says. And then there's the Sadducees, the elders, the Pharisees. They all have come to Jesus, and, and every time they hear Jesus speak, they harden their heart. Even at the end of this interaction with the scribe, this individual scribe, all the rest of the religious establishment that's gathered around, as you see in verse 34, harden themselves even farther because they don't ask any follow-up questions. They just don't dare to ask Him anything else. It, it means that they completely shun Jesus away so that He might not speak any more words of life to them. They love their death. They love their iniquity. And so each and every time the Word of God is preached from the pulpit here at First Presbyterian Church, or even, even any, any time that, that the Gospel is preached from a Bible-proclaiming pulpit, there is two responses that we must consider. Are we going to accept, be willing to hear, live out what Jesus has commanded? Are we going to come humbly before the Word and, and ready to ready to do as our Lord has commanded, or are we going to shun ourselves away, slam our Bible shut, and shun Him for the rest of the day, for we cannot bear to hear another word of life, for we love our death. That's something that we need to consider, I think. 
And if we say, and I hope that we all can say, I am ready and I am willing and I am humbly accepting anything my Jesus has to say to me, then and only then may we move to loving God and loving neighbor. And I think that's what we need to consider here. Those two commands that Jesus uses to respond to the scribe's question. If you look back with me at verse 29, Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. Immediately, if we are good Bible readers, we've heard this before. We've actually heard this before in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it's called what we uh, know the Hebrew word for here is the Shema. It, it, it's something that, that Jewish fathers would, would teach their children very early on in the faith. It's the fact that our God is one. Our triune God exists in one being, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we must love Him with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength. Now, I I understand, um, and I actually have some commentaries by some Puritans that have preached 12, 15, 18, 24 part sermons on just the Shema. I'm not that interesting. Um, And so we're just going to handle it maybe in a couple of points this morning. I want to kind of draw your attention to a couple of things. I want you to notice first how comprehensive Jesus' command is. When he tells the, the scribe that you must love me, this one God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength, you need to understand that this is comprehensive for your whole being. You think about the way that God has created us. He's created us with a heart. He's created us with a soul. He's created us with a mind. He's created us with a human body, with strength. And and when Jesus regenerates us, redeems us by His Word and Spirit, He changes our hearts. He changes our souls. He changes our minds. And He changes our strength. It's a comprehensive call that Jesus is beckoning the scribe to. He's telling him that God created you, that God owns you, that God has redeemed you, or at least in this case, redeeming you, that God loves you with a covenantal love, and it's an appropriate thing to cast your allegiance only to him. Therefore, you will love him wholeheartedly. You will love him with all of your being. You will love Him with a love that encompasses every facet, every aspect of your life. Now let me show you maybe some slippery slopes to this. Because our default is to kind of pick and choose one according to our personality. I know we all have different personalities and maybe we even have uh, different learning styles, we would say. And so, so the temptation is for us to maybe Love God merely with our minds. You know, that, that, that attitude that says, I like to think about deep theological conversations. I like to get into the scholarship, the academia of reading God's Word. But that is the nature of my love for Him. I don't really feel excited about Him. I don't really pray to Him. I don't really even know what he is doing per se, but I, but I know every answer to every theological question that you might have, and let's debate. That's, that is a, a, a life that wants to just honor and love God merely with the mind. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you say, I want to love God with all of my heart, but only my heart. You know, I want to get emotional and I want to get teary-eyed when I hear the latest a uh, contemporary Christian song on the radio. I, I, want to, I want to feel His presence. I want to experience Him. And those things aren't wrong per se, but, but when theological questions come up, or even when me or Pastor Don uses a theological word in a Sunday school lesson or in a, or in a sermon, you, you tune out. I don't, I don't need that. 
I don't need to learn that. I just, I just want Jesus. I want to experience Jesus. I love him with all of my heart. And it all sounds good, doesn't it? But don't you see how Jesus is calling us to a, a, full, a full life that honors him? What about this? A, a, a person, a type of person that might say, I want to love God with all of my strength. And you, you know these guys. They're stoic. They're not really theological, nor are they emotional. But they're committed. And so they want to, you know, they want to work at the church, no matter what the duty is. They, they, they want to, to serve, and, and they want more work days. They want more and more work days at the church so that they might express the love of God that they have uh, in, their, in, their, in their strength by, by service. But they're not interested in thinking anything about, they're not interested in thinking about anything about what, or who Jesus is or what he's done. They don't want to think theologically. They surely don't want an emotional experience. They just want to kind of be their stoic. They don't want to move their lips when, when we sing praises to God. They don't want to bow their heads when we pray to God. But they'll throw some pine straw. That is the strength. And you see the danger in that as well, I hope. You see, when... when when God calls us through the words of Jesus Christ here in our text to love Him with all of our being, he is, He's in, including all of these things. He's, comp, he's including your strength. He's including your mind. He's including your heart. He's saying, I want, I want it all. And because I created you, I, I deserve it all. Because I have redeemed you, it's all mine. And so give it to me. And with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love me. But also love your neighbor. Very quickly, I want to look at the second part of Jesus' command. This loving neighbor. Have you ever heard that there's a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension towards, towards our Christian life? Or to our Christian life? That we must love God, yes, but we also must love one another. Well, Jesus hits that same kind of plane. Vertical, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength, and now love your neighbor as yourself. And, and what's very important here for us to understand on this horizontal dimension is that when God changes our hearts and gives us a love for Him, when He makes His gospel the treasure of our lives, the part of our transformation will always be that our love for Him pours out in our love for neighbor it will always spill out for our love for one another john piper one of the most famous authors in today's generation says in his most famous book probably desiring god that love is the overflow of joy in god which gladly meets the needs of others see he's hitting on that vertical and horizontal plane love is the overflow of joy in god which gladly meets the needs of others and this is how we should think about loving God and loving neighbor. It's not merely a duty that we do, something that we check off. It's not something that we say, you know, while we're laying in bed on a, on a Saturday morning, you know what, I haven't shown any love for neighbor recently, and so let me go do something. That's not what Jesus is, is saying. Jesus is saying as we follow Him, as we belong to the Father, as we spend time with Him in His Word and in prayer, as we cultivate a, a deep, delight a deep love in him vertically it will pour out it will show itself horizontally it will expand into the delight of 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 helping one another and loving one another and you say well matt what does jesus mean about as yourself well we love ourselves don't we that, this isn't a dr phil statement by jesus i don't think but but it but it's definitely something that needs to be mentioned because remember how we said that our minds our hearts our desires our love is tainted by sin even as new creations we struggle in our sin guess 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 what we struggle with we we struggle with pride we we struggle with humility we struggle with sacrificial love especially to one another and so Jesus says when you serve me, when you love me, this isn't the time for a self-esteem boost. 
and throw in the trash every devotional that you have in your house that, that points you in that direction. Because the gospel says, love me, love neighbor. Your love for me will pour out to your love for each other. You know, one of the things that's, that has stuck with me, and I maybe shouldn't say it because it's you know, a frustration I had with one of my professors, but um, one of my professors in, in, in my preaching class, uh, a, a young AME pastor preached. And, and of course, the AME pastor preached a little bit different than the Presbyterian preacher. I mean, I'll give you that. He had a little bit more passion, had a little bit more experience. Maybe his volume was a little higher. No, his volume wasn't higher than mine. Uh, you know, I talk loud. But, but nonetheless, you know, it was a little bit more emotional than most Presbyterian sermons. And my professor said, you know, you really shouldn't have that much fun preaching the gospel. You shouldn't find that kind of personal enjoyment in proclaiming the good news of the gospel. And I thought, for my, thought to myself, boy, are you wrong. This should be our greatest delight. Not only to proclaim the good news of the gospel, so that a lost and dying world might hear the good news of Jesus. But our greatest delight should be that an overflow of our love for God, that vertical relationship, would pour out to a horizontal relationship so that they might not only hear it by our words, but that they might see it through our love. See, our resurrection to new life gives us a regenerated, a new heart, and that new heart sacrificially loves and because of Jesus' resurrection, we can be assured that we are made anew. And now we can go out, not just as some sort of New Year's resolution, but as a real point of faith and say, I want to strive to love God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love my neighbor as myself. As we meditate on these things this Lord's Day, let us pray that God will give us more unction to do so. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray, O oh Lord, that you would set us on fire for thee, that we would uh, love you more, that we would want to spend time with you more, that we would crave, that we would yearn over more time with thee in our Bibles and in prayer and in Lord's Day worship services. And therefore, O oh Lord, that our love for thee might pour out uh, to action for thee, that we would love God and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. And so, Father, let us have that sacrificial love first for you and let that spill out to a sacrificial love for one another so that the world might know whom we belong in word and in deed from this time into eternity. Amen. It's good for us to sing in response to uh, God's word. And so let us uh, stand as you're able. Let's take those hymn books in our hands. We're going to turn to hymn number 334, 334, and we're going to sing, Breathe on me, breath of God.
Let me remind you of our evening worship service tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to continue our journey through the Apostles' Creed and now receive the Lord's benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.